welcome to Volcano Explorers. You can see here we're, uh, we're not in our usual uh, conference room. We're actually at the Pacific Science Center today. Uh, I'm Ray Erkowitz. I'm the Operations Director for the Mount St. Helens Institute. And our presenter today is Pepper Hambrick with the Pacific Science Center. We've got this great uh, display here today that she's going to present on. I want to thank our partners, uh, USGS, uh, the Forest Service, uh, Washington State Historical Museum, Pacific Science Center, and Chevron. Got to go through some of the logistics for the presentation today. Um, we'll have a short introduction here. I'll ask Pepper a couple questions. Uh, she's got about a 20 minute presentation. Then there'll be about five or 10 minutes at the end for a question and answer. So if you think of questions uh, during the presentation, write them down and you can enter them into the chat box and we'll go ahead and respond to those at the end. Uh, there's also a couple of questions that Pepper's going to pose during the presentation and they'll, they'll pop up as a poll. So each class can go ahead and uh, uh, enter their answer on the poll and see how everybody answers overall, which will go over the answers. If there's any technical issues, you can uh, ask those questions in the chat box. And Abby, who uh, on the other end there at Amboy, will go ahead and deal with those. At the very end, there's a survey, so make sure you fill that out for us. There's some important questions there. So, to start, a couple of questions for you. Uh, what exactly do you do? What is your job? Uh, my job here at Pacific Science Center is at, as a performance science educator. So what that means is I communicate um, scientific concepts to the public. Great. Well, how did you become interested in this career? How did you get into the steps along the way? It's um, not really a linear path. My background is in literature and in acting. Um, and I've always had an interest in science and in exploring, and I grew up you know, catching animals and interested in space and all that sort of thing. Um, so this just uh, opened itself up as a way for me to communicate my love of those things, but using the skills that I had from other fields. Well, careers in science being good. It's true. Great. Well, I'll let you go for it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, folks, and welcome to Pacific Science Center's Science on a Sphere. Um, as Ray said, my name is Pepper, and I will be doing a presentation today about volcanoes. Great. So uh, some of you who uh, don't live in this area may not that I am standing less than 100 miles from a volcano right now. I'm also standing a couple hundred feet from our Pompeii exhibit, which is a traveling exhibit. And um, for those reasons, I think it's really important for us to talk about volcanoes and what happens when volcanoes erupt. Even if you don't live in an area where there is volcanic activity, um, it's important for understanding what's happening in the rest of the world. And it's also important because the things that we take away from immersive Preparedness can be useful in a whole bunch of different situations. So today we're specifically talking about volcanoes, but this could apply to a lot of different things. Now, first, if I have a scientific problem, I am going to pull out my science toolkit, and this has everything I need in it to try to answer the questions that I have. Right now, I have a question, but it's really vague. It's just, oh, volcanoes, what is it? So I'm going to ask a question, and by that, I actually mean I'm going to clarify my question. So the questions we want to answer today are, where do we find volcanoes, right? Where do we need to worry about this? Um, how do volcanoes form? And lastly, what happens when they erupt? What happens, what comes out of a volcano? And what can we do to be prepared for the event of a volcanic eruption? So the first step is to make observations. That means gathering data, right? Where are the various places that we can get data? Um, there's all sorts of places. There's books, there's the internet, there are scientific experts. There are all sorts of ways you can get information. There are also maps. Um, the reason uh, that we're here today is that we're going to use something that we have the opportunity here that um, is really, really special. And that is Science on the Sphere. This is donated by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And with it, we can look at a whole bunch of different things. Now, as you notice, when we look at these, we are looking at global things. We're not looking at uh, specifics. We're looking at the interaction of large systems. So we've got land, we've got water, we've got weather, all kinds of things happening here. So in this case, though, we're just looking at the Earth. We're not looking at anything with specific volcanic information. So let's look at where volcanoes are located. I happen to have a data set here that shows us all the volcanic activity around the world. Now, as you look at this map, take a look at where those volcanoes are located. Are they all 
scattered randomly? Are they in similar areas? Can we draw any conclusion from what we're looking at? And you may notice that they occur more or less in lines. And as I move through the Earth, you'll notice that they basically ring the Pacific Ocean. You might have heard of the Ring of Fire, and that's what that's referring to. There is volcanic activity all around that area. So what kind of conclusions can we draw from that? What can we do to analyze the data? There are a lot of different reasons uh, this might occur, um, but the thing that we're talking about here has to do with tectonic plates. So when I overlay plate boundaries, you'll see that there is a very strong correlation between those boundaries and volcanic activity. But what are tectonic plates? Tectonic plates are the uh, sections of the Earth's crust that move on top of the mantle. Now, they're not moving fast enough for us to feel them. They're moving about four centimeters per year on average, but they're moving enough for us to have a lot of effects happen um, because of that movement. Now, what we're talking about here is a very specific form of movement. If you have two plates that are moving like this and shifting, you're going to get an earthquake, right? But I want you all to raise your hands like this and pretend that one of these plates is an oceanic plate and one is a continental plate. When they shove together this way, the oceanic plate or the denser plate gets shoved underneath. And something's going to happen when you get all of that uh, extra earth and rock down towards the mantle, it's going to start to melt. And then that magma is going to have to find somewhere to go. And then you get a volcano. Now just to go back to um, where those areas are found, take a look at those volcanic locations again. Take a look at specifically what I'm concerned about for myself, where we are, where I am. So if you look up here in the Pacific Northwest, pull that down a little bit, you'll see that there's a lot of volcanic activity right next to that plate boundary. And I can show you even more specifically where I am right now. If you look at this map of Washington, I'm here in Seattle. The map right here is down here. And you'll notice the scale at the bottom. This is 100 miles right here. So I am a lot less than 100 miles from Mount Rainier. So with that in mind, let's take a look at Mount Rainier. Now, we're talking about a couple different types of volcanoes here, because you may have noticed that there were some of those volcanoes that weren't anywhere near that subduction zone, anywhere near that line. So when you look at these different types of volcanoes, you can draw conclusions about how they're formed. One of them is called a stratovolcano. And you look at this shape, and what do you notice about it? It's kind of pointy, triangular. It's more of a cone shape. Compare that shape to what we call a shield volcano. It's a lot lower. And it has a very, very different shape. So when we're looking at that, what, uh, what accounts for the difference between those? There are a lot of different factors that can affect uh, geologic features, and erosion is one, there's different kinds of actions. But right here, we're talking about something else. We're talking about something called viscosity, okay? Viscosity is how we describe the thickness of a liquid. So if we have different thicknesses of magma, and then when it emerges lava, we're gonna have very different effects. So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna show you this with these two vials. This has different thicknesses uh, representing types of lava. And when I turn them over, I want you to see how fast they move and if there is a difference. So I'm gonna turn these over. You might notice that the one in my left hand moves a lot quicker than the one in my right hand. The one in my right hand is a lot thicker. So what does this mean for the shape of those mountains? One comparison that we could make is to say making pancakes. If your pancake batter is really, really thick, your pancakes are gonna be a lot taller and they're not gonna spread out as much. If your pancake batter is really, really thin, they will move out very quickly and your pancakes will be flatter and they will spread out much wider. So with these things in mind, looking back at Mount Rainier, 
looking at where we are located here, I want you folks to discuss whether you think Mount Rainier is a stratovolcano or a shield volcano. So I'll give you a minute to talk about that and we'll come back. All right, looks like folks are answering stratovolcano. Great. So Ray just told me that folks are answering stratovolcano, which is exactly right. Uh, we here in the Pacific Northwest are on a subduction zone. This is a fairly conical-shaped mountain, and we do have that, uh, that type of volcano here. Now, the reason why the magma there is thicker is because it's mixing with all of the other things under the Earth on its way up. So when it emerges, you're going to have this type of flow. Uh, some place like Hawaii, you have a hot spot. You don't have all of that extra mixing in. So that lava is a lot thinner, a lot less viscous. And then that's how we get those uh, lava flows that flow up quickly and create islands for us. So perfect. Thank you for answering that. So we're comparing uh, Mount Rainier today to Vesuvius just because um, it's a lot of uh, things we hear a lot about Pompeii, we hear a lot about Vesuvius. We also don't know a whole lot about Rainier erupting, at least in recent memory. So when we look at something like Mount Vesuvius, we can try to draw some comparisons between them. So here is a picture of Mount Vesuvius. Again, the shape of this mountain could be for several different reasons. So in order to find out what type of volcano Vesuvius is, we are going to have to look again at those locations. Is Vesuvius on a subduction zone? So I'm going to show you where we are looking here, and I want you to tell me whether we have a subduction zone or not. So I'm gonna move over to Italy. And it might be hard to see on here, but I want you to notice here are the Italian volcanoes, here is the plate boundary. So with that in mind, do we have a subduction zone here uh, with Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii? All right, here's another poll. Do you think that this is a subduction zone where Mount Vesuvius is? Where was it again on there? It is right here. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Well, some folks think that, yes, that is a subduction zone. Great. If you did answer it's a, that it, it is a subduction zone, you are also correct. Now, it looks a little bit different from our subduction zone over here. And this is because you have the African plate moving underneath the Eurasian plate. So it's a similar mechanism, but the composition of that earth is going to be different and different effects are going to, to uh, come to light. So let's compare them a little further. 
I have a comparison here of Mount Rainier next to Mount Vesuvius, an aerial view. Now, it might be difficult to see these pictures from where you are, but let's look. What's the, the most obvious thing you can see here? The most obvious thing I see here is that there's a lot of light on Mount Rainier. And if you've ever seen Mount Rainier, you'll know that it is covered in snow and glaciers all year round. Now, this is going to create a very different effect in the event of a volcanic eruption. Uh, when a volcano erupts, that lava is going to mix with that snow and ice and dirt. And it's going to create something very different from a lava flow. And that is called a lahar. That's a word I didn't know until I moved out here. And so while lava flows can um, go for you know, several square miles, a lahar is going to move further and faster than a lava flow. So that's something that we're concerned about here in the Pacific Northwest. And I have a video of that lahar, one of these lahars that I want to show you. So take a look at this. So from here, it just looks sort of like a muddy river, but as it gets closer, you'll notice that there are boulders and all sorts of things. So just imagine sort of a hot concrete avalanche. Yeah, that's probably something you don't want to be in the way of, which is why if you see one of these signs nearby, if you live near one or you're vacationing, you might want to notice which way the arrows are pointed. This is a volcano evacuation route sign. And so in the event of an eruption or a lahar or something else, um, you would want to find one of these so that you could figure out where safe places are to go. Great. So that's something we're worried about here, but let's go back to Rainier and Vesuvius. And I have some good news for us here in the Pacific Northwest. One of the other things I noticed from these images is that Mount Vesuvius is surrounded by city. This is Naples. Pompeii is actually even closer than Naples to Vesuvius. So when you look at Mount Rainier, while there are people there, it is not an urban environment. And so that is a very different situation for us as opposed to some other places. So um, every volcano is different. And so the conclusions that we draw about them um, have, to, have to be modified because of that. Now, like I said, uh, Mount Rainier has not erupted in anyone's lifetime here. So we have to look at other areas again to draw comparisons. There's one thing we haven't talked about that comes out of volcanoes, and that is volcanic ash. I have a jar of it here. And so since we don't know exactly what will happen when Rainier erupts, we might find other models to look at. Today we're going to look at an eruption in Iceland. So if you speak Icelandic, I'm very sorry, but I'm going to do my best to pronounce this. This is Eyjafjallajökull. de Jokut. It is a volcano that erupted in 2010, and it uh, had a very significant effect on its surroundings due to the ash cloud. So this is a model of that ash cloud, and I'm going to hit play, and we're going to look at where that ash goes. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. It's very faint, but you're going to start to see a cloud. Here's Iceland, and that cloud is now moving all the way over here. So unlike a lava flow or a lahar, where it's going to stay relatively close to that volcano, the, the uh, consequences of that ash cloud are much more uh, far-reaching. Uh, in this case, that ash cloud went all over Europe, and it shut down airports for weeks, because that ash goes uh, up to 30,000 feet into the air. Uh, visibility drops for pilots. It also affects airplane engines. So those airports shut down for days and it had far-reaching consequences for people all over Europe, not just in Iceland. Okay, but that's Iceland, that's not here. We don't know exactly what would happen here, but we can make some educated guesses. If we look at a model of typical wind patterns in North America, and we look at where we are, we can make some guesses about where that ash cloud would go. Now it's pretty clear it's not going to go west out to sea, it is going to go east across the top of this continent into Canada and northern United States. And when you talk to people who were here for, say, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, they will report having to shovel ash off of their driveways for states like hundreds of miles away from here, um, out to the west. So that is another thing you might want to think about. We're a uh, volcano here to have an eruption. Um, where would the ash go? Who would be affected by that? It's another thing to think about. Now, I'm talking about all this not to, you know, be really scary. Um, these are dangerous things. But the whole reason we're here is to design a solution. 
What is the solution? Can we stop volcanoes from erupting? No. Can we accurately predict when they're going to erupt? No, we know that there is the possibility for them to erupt, but we can't make really accurate predictions about when exactly that would happen. So what we need to do is to pay close attention and to communicate information. We need to be prepared. So we have scientists monitoring the situation, so we need to be able to listen to them. That's great. But there's something that all of us can do for ourselves and our families, and that is to be prepared, have a plan, have an emergency preparedness kit. Now, like I said at the beginning of my presentation, this is relevant whether or not you live near a volcano. There's all kinds of other things that can happen in any part of the world uh, that you might want to be prepared for. So what I want you folks to discuss for the next 30 seconds or so is what things could happen in your region that you would want to be prepared for and what kind of things would you have with you to be prepared. All right, welcome back. Um, hopefully that's a good discussion that can continue at other times because I think it's a really important one to have. You might have seen some of the things that I had in my preparedness kit. There's a first aid kit, that's important. There is water, there's a way to carry water. There's emergency food rations. There's also things that operate on batteries, uh, flashlights, radios. We need to be able to get information. We need to be able to see. We need to rely on things that don't require the power to be working. You might also have seen um, duct tape. That's useful in a lot of situations. A poncho, toiletries, because hygiene can be really important when you have uh, situations where there could be disease spreading or, or illness. Um, I also had a face mask in there. That's often useful for when people are ill, but it's also good if there's ash in the air. There's a lot of things you can include. Um, I personally would put a deck of cards or a book or something in there because there might be a lot of waiting around. So there's all kinds of other things you can include, um, but uh, I encourage all of you to make a plan and be prepared. That concludes my presentation on uh, Science on a Sphere. I want to take any questions that you have and thank you for joining us here this morning at Pacific Science Center. Thank you. Let's see, so if you got any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat box there. Are we in a in a volcanic hazard zone right here in Seattle? Um, from the maps that I've seen about the actual hazards in this area, um, this this specific spot isn't directly in the path. Uh, when I've seen predicted lahar flows and and that sort of thing, um, but there are areas that are close to us where, um, because of the lay of the land, uh, the lahar flows do come close to a lot of, of populated areas. Um, you talk about the Pompeii exhibit that you've got going here. How long is it going and, and what, what's there to see? Uh, well, right now we are the last stop um, on the American tour of the Pompeii exhibit. So it has a lot of artifacts from Pompeii um, and it runs here through Memorial Day. What's that? Memorial Day. Through Memorial Day. So through the end of the month. So there's plenty of time to catch that. Uh, I think it's really fascinating because it shows just, um, it was so well preserved that there's a lot to learn both about volcanic eruptions, but also about how people were living in 79 AD, which is not all that different from how we live today. And I think all of those things working together are very, make a very interesting exhibit. Great. Well, I hope folks can come check that out here in the next couple of weeks. It is an exciting month for volcanoes here in the Pacific Northwest. I just want to say thank you very much. Well, thank you, Greg. Yeah. Thank you so much for the Pacific Science Center for having us here today. Uh, you, of course, can watch this on YouTube. Um, 
get in there. And thanks also to all of our sponsors again, USGS, uh, US Forest Service, Washington Historic Museum, and Chevron. The next volcano explorer is next Friday, uh, right around the 35th anniversary of the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. So that's going to be the 1980 eruption story. So make sure to tune in for that. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.